Okay, so today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 4, verses 1 through 15, uh, Pew Bible, page 728. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the, t into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but the water I give them will, will never thirst indeed. The water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. All right, am I on? Okay, I think we got it figured out. Just need to make good connections. Actually, that's what this sermon is about, <clears throat> making good connections. Uh, well, over the next few weeks, both on Sunday morning and in our small groups, we are going to be talking about being witnesses to the gospel of Jesus. There's a, another word that we have for this that we use called evangelism, otherwise known as the E-word. Now, Christianity has always been a missionary religion. In fact, Jesus' last words in, in two of the Gospels basically said, go and make disciples or go and preach the gospel or you will be my witnesses. And uh, of course, when someone gives their last words, you pay attention because they're pretty intentional about their last words. Now, <clears throat> Our world is very different than the world of Jesus and the world of the apostles when Jesus first gave those instructions. And so there are a lot of things about evangelism that we'll have to do that are different than what we see in Scripture. But there's actually one thing, well, probably more than one thing, but one very important thing that is the same today as it was back then. And that is that it's the Holy Spirit that empowers our witness. Okay, the same Holy Spirit that was alive back then is alive today. Now, I, I can't remember which commentator uh, wrote this story, but I know that they were uh, like a South African or South, uh, South American uh, theologian. But they said one time they remember a group of American, uh, a, a, an American church basically going on a short-term mission project to Colombia, and they were wearing shirts when they got off at the airport Say, that said, bringing Jesus to Columbia. And, of course, this theologian was a little bit offended by that, uh, thinking, do they think that Jesus is not already here? And, uh, and, of course, this oftentimes is our mindset and sometimes why we are so hesitant to do evangelism because we think that we are bringing Jesus to people. 
But the truth of the matter is, Jesus is already there, and so the job of the evangelist is simply to be in tune with the Holy Spirit and to see where Jesus is already working in the lives of the people around us and to uh, share that with them, to see what he's already doing in their lives. Now, we're going to draw on some things that we can learn from both Jesus and the apostles and how they did evangelism. But over the next few weeks, we're actually going to learn some of the how-tos for witnessing in our particular society, in our postmodern society, because there are challenges that are unique to the culture, to the day that we live in. Now, I don't know if that makes it harder to do evangelism here than in other places. For instance, I don't know if it's harder to do evangelism here than it is in a Muslim country where it's illegal to share the gospel. Right? But there are some unique barriers that people have to faith in Jesus when they are a part of our society. And uh, for a lot of it, we're going to be relying on the book called I Once Was Lost, and you can purchase that if you would like. We don't have a lot of copies for everyone, but if you'd like to go and purchase that and follow along, you can, you can certainly do that. Uh, but it was written by a couple of men who have been involved in evangelism for more than 20 years uh, through InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. They've done evangelism to thousands of people, and they've trained uh, people to do evangelism as well. And, and so what they found is that over the years, that there are basically five thresholds that people in our society need to get over or to hurdles that they need to get through. Uh, in order to come to faith in Jesus. And we've talked about them briefly a couple of times already, but, but we're going to take a, a deeper look at them during this series. And I want to give you just a real quick overview so you can see where we're going with this. And, uh, and then we'll dive right into the first threshold. Now, the graphic that they use is this one right here, if you can read that. It's also in your notes, if you have your notes. Uh, the thresholds go like this. The first one is moving people from distrust to, dr to trust. And that's the one we're going to talk about today, so I won't spend any more time on it. Second, people have to move from apathy to curiosity. Okay, there are some people who just aren't very interested in Christianity, and so you want to be able to pique curiosity in spiritual things, but not just spiritual things, but in Jesus himself. Third, they have to become open to change. Now, as much as we like to talk about grace being free, we know that when someone comes to Jesus, there are oftentimes things in their lives that need to change. And there are things in our lives probably that need to change as well. Okay? But we know that that's oftentimes a barrier for people. Sometimes their barrier is not so much intellectual, but it's lifestyle things that they don't necessarily want to change. Fourth, they move from meandering to seeking. Now, this comes from the fact that there are a lot of people in our society today that say they're spiritual but not religious. And I think for some people that's probably very true. They are very spiritual and they do things on their own. But for a lot of people, that's just kind of a, a way of saying, I want to appear spiritual but not really put any effort into it. And so there's a, there's a threshold that they have to get through there to say, no, actually, I am going to put some effort into this. I'm actually going to seek truth and see what is out there. And so we'll talk about how do we take people through this threshold. And then finally, people move from being a seeker to entering the kingdom, to being a follower of Jesus. This is when they cross the line of faith. Okay, so that's basically the, uh, basically the uh, structure of how we're going to talk about this over the next few weeks. Now, a couple of things that you need to recognize is, is that, number one, this is not necessarily sequential. It's not necessarily a step-by-step -step thing. For instance, not everyone is distrustful of Christians. And so you might have a friend who knows lots of Christians, but they just think, well, Christianity just isn't for me. And if that's the case, then you don't really have to try to move them through this threshold because they're already there. There are also many Christians who are open to change, who, or, or many non-Christians who are open to change. And actually, you probably know some people who you go, wow, they would make a really good Christian because their lifestyle already kind of looks like Jesus. They just don't have the beliefs to go with it. So there's not, actually not a whole lot of changes that they would have to make. It's just getting them over the intellectual hurdle with Jesus. And so while we can see that there are general barriers that people have to go over, everyone is unique. And that's why we can't use a one-size-fits-all uh, one prepackaged uh, program to share the gospel. But these are things that you have to think about as, people, uh, as you're sharing Jesus with other people. And so we're going to be following that general pattern. But let's start today by talking about moving people from distrust 
to trust. Now, I don't want to overplay this and make it seem like every non-Christian is against Christianity or has something against Christians, because I just don't think that's the case. But certainly you will encounter people in our day and age who don't trust Christians. In fact, I had a conversation with someone in the last couple of days who said they were at a meeting at work and it kind of turned into a church bashing session. And they were wondering, well, how do I, how do I re respond to that? The church has been really good to me. I haven't had that same experience. But, but there were a number of people, a number of co-workers, who were having this conversation about how terrible the church was. Uh, so you'll encounter people who don't really care for Christians or for churches. And there are a few reasons why that might be the case. Okay? Let, me, let me talk about a few of those. One reason is that for the first time in a while in our society, there are some people who just really don't know any sincere, committed Christians. Okay? And then this is compounded by the fact that in, they tend to be either ignored or uh, shown in a negative light in a lot of popular media today. Okay? For instance, you know, a, a majority of people in the United States still claim to be Christians, and somewhere around 40% of Americans actually still uh, are regular churchgoers. Okay, so keep that in mind when you think about the TV shows or the movies that you watch. Okay, how many committed Christian characters are a part of those shows? Probably not very many, not very many that I've seen. Now, there's a, there's a big push in Hollywood right now for like realistic portrayals or, or uh, realistic representation for people like minorities and all of that. And actually, I think that's a great thing. I think that's a good goal to have. But it doesn't seem like that goal applies to Christians. Okay? And again, I'm not complaining about this. I'm not saying this is a huge injustice or anything. But I am saying that it does impact how people think about Christianity. And then add on to that the fact that oftentimes when Christians are portrayed in popular media, they're portrayed in a negative light. I read one author who talked about like three uh, sort of ways that, they're, that, that Christians are oftentimes portrayed. Uh, one of them is, is the sweet idiot. Um, like uh, Ned Flanders or Kenneth from 30 Rock. You probably have seen those guys. Uh, the judgmental hypocrite, uh, Angela from The Office, um, or the dangerous fanatic. Okay? And so you have all of these various portrayals of Christians in the media. And of course, if someone doesn't know a genuine Christian and then they see these portrayals in the media, it starts to become reality for them and it impacts how they think about Christianity. Okay? So that's one aspect basically, of why a lot of people think negatively about Christianity. But there's also the fact that in many ways, Christians have earned the mistrust. Sometimes we are judgmental. Sometimes we do lack grace. There have certainly been enough high-end profile, high-profile scandals in churches to give people the impression that Christians can't be trusted. As one author wrote, we've scored a lot of own goals. Been enough Christians who have been engaged in dirty politics and found out to be corrupt to warrant a lot of the mistrust that people have about Christianity. And I, you know, I believe that Christianity has, has had a lot of good moments. In fact, I think we've had more good moments than bad moments. But we've also given people enough ammunition to believe that Christians cannot be trusted. And add to that the fact that there have been many people who have been personally hurt by churches who lacked care, who lacked grace, who lacked understanding. They've had personal interactions with other Christians who were very hurtful because those Christians didn't act very much like Jesus. In fact, when I met with a group of non-believers today, it used to be when I started my ministry, I didn't have a problem telling people that I was a pastor. Now I kind of try to hide that information because what I find is, is that rather than making people interested in what I do, it actually shuts down conversation very quickly. Now, I know that this is oftentimes a hard conversation for us to have. Of course, we look around the room and we say, this is a group of really good people. They're, you know, godly people and, and great and kind and all of those things. And so, it, you know, it's a little hurtful that people would, would mistrust us. Okay? Well, in the book, I Once Was Lost, they, they list... Some of the responses, some of the knee-jerk reactions that we often have when people are distrustful of Christians, okay? Let me just tell you what those are. Maybe see if any of these uh, fit you. 
The first one is for us to become defensive about it. We might say something like, oh, the media just finds every bad thing that Christians do and then they broadcast it everywhere. But they never say anything good about Christians, right? And oftentimes that's our first reaction. Or we distance ourselves from our other uh, Christian brothers and sisters. We say, well, I'm not like those other Christians. Okay? So we become defensive. Or sometimes we just bruise really easily. We become offended. We become hurt. Okay, this is similar to becoming defensive, but this is when just about any topic can become a sore spot for us. And I think as a whole, American Christians can oftentimes develop a bit of a persecution complex because we do breed, uh, we do bruise pretty easily, start to feel sorry for ourselves. And oftentimes then that leads to the third reaction, which is avoidance. We just avoid our non-Christian neighbors. And then we, you know, retreat to our own huddles and we go to our Bible studies and worship service and hang out with our Christian friends because, you know, who needs, who needs those guys anyway? Okay, if they're going to be so mean to us. But the problem is, is then we lose our influence in the world. Or sometimes we actually can judge them. Those godless pagans are so blinded by their sin, they can't even see that Christians are really good people. Or we can become argumentative. Okay, now, there's a, there's a place to, you know, change people's minds. There's a place for things like apologetics, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the series. How do we, how do we uh, try to change people's minds when it comes to Christianity and Christian beliefs? And we'll, like I said, we'll address that later. But what you need to know is that our initial response matters a great deal. And, and so the question is, is if we encounter people who are distrustful of Christians... How do we help to get them through that barrier from distrust to, dr to trust, okay? I'm going to talk about this in two different ways, okay? First, I'm going to talk about it corporately, like how do we do this together? And then I'm going to talk about personally, what are some things that, that you can do to help build trust in people, okay? So let's talk about, first of all, how the church or how we together can build trust for people. Matthew chapter 5. Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this. It's a pretty familiar passage. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. All right? So, a very simple way to do this is let your light shine. Now, one of the ways, uh, or many of the ways that we do this is that we as a church try to be active in our community and to do good things in ways that everyone recognizes are good. All right? So, for instance, we'll do things like the Easter egg hunt great family event for people. Even if they're not believers, they love to come out and, you know, we try to get the neighborhood together. Uh, in a few weeks, we're going to do the free oil change day for, for, low, in, for, people, uh, for low income people. Uh, we've done uh, bike day uh, in the past. We buy coffee for teachers on the first day of school at the coffee shop. And, uh, and, and next week, we'll talk about another ministry that, that we can do to, to build trust in our neighborhood. Basically, to say, what are some good things that we can all agree on? And let's do that. Let's lean into those things for people. And, and we do them, and we try to be public about them because they help to create goodwill for people. And hopefully, what they'll see is that we really do genuinely care about our neighborhood. And I hope that that's the case, that, that we do it out of care for our neighborhood. People don't necessarily come, come to Jesus directly from those ministries, although it has happened before. But what they do is, is that they help to build trust in the people around us. And so we do this by finding points of commonality. Okay, we often talk about the ways that the church is different from the world. And there certainly are many ways that we are different from the world. But there are also many things that we can agree on. And we want to lean into those things, and it creates goodwill. But actually, sometimes... It creates a little bit of a, a cognitive dissonance. I found this interesting. I saw this the other day. Uh, we've seen throughout the book of Luke and actually starting in the book of Acts as well that care for the poor and marginalized is a core value of Christianity. Okay? It's part of Christian ethics. And the great thing is, is that 
it also is something that our society happens to care about today. It hasn't always been that way, but that's something that our society really does uh, think is a good thing, okay? This is not a value that we made up. It's not a value that we do to follow the culture. This is an authentic Christian value. And so we can do things like we can, you know, serve the poor, care for the poor. We can point out uh, injustices, whether it's human trafficking or racism or whatever. These are core to Christianity, but they are also things that our society agrees with. Can society deal with them in all unhealthy ways? Of course they can. Okay? But what we want to do is, is that we want to be the best at these things uh, because they're things that our society knows are good. And we will say they're right about that. All right? So we, uh, we went through the, the book of First Peter uh, last fall, I think it was. And, uh, and one of the things that we read here was from 1 Peter 2, 12. And this is really interesting because oftentimes, not only does it create some goodwill, but it also creates a little bit of cognitive dissonance, okay? And this is what Peter says, because they were in a society that's very similar to, to ours. He writes this in 1 Peter 2, 12. Live such good lives, in other words, lives that everyone can agree are good lives, okay? Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. That's familiar language, isn't it? Sounds a lot like uh, Matthew chapter 5, right? So here's what he's saying. Live such good lives. Okay? This means, of course, first of all, that we should practice what we preach. Okay? That means that as believers, we have to live lives of integrity and self-control and kindness. Okay? If we're going to have something to say about sexual ethics, then we have to be willing to live up to it as well. We have to model that. We can't just say it and then do something else. And so we have to be people who live lives of virtue first and foremost. But living good lives also means outward acts of mercy, okay? like what we were just talking about. Okay? Now, look at what Peter says is the result of this. Right? There are two things. He says, first of all, though they accuse you of doing wrong... In other words, even if you do everything right, sometimes you're going to be accused of doing wrong. You're going to have some points of disagreement with the prevailing society. Okay, but then notice what Peter says as he goes on. He says, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds, and what do they do? They glorify God on the day he visits us. Okay? In other words, they come to the point where they, where they go, okay, Maybe their morality is a little bit backwards. It's not really up with the times. But, man, they're just such good people. You know, and so it just creates this little bit of dissonance in people. Though they accuse you wrong, of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Okay, now, remember, those good deeds have to be authentic Christianity, biblically and theologically sound. Okay, this is, I think, one of the problems oftentimes with how Christians uh, live in our society today, how we, how we interact publicly. So, for instance, you know, this is not about relevance. It's not being relevant to our society. Okay, but what it is, is, you know, we have to be careful not to be like some who will say something like, well, it seems like the liberal side is, is winning right now, and so let's adapt, adopt the whole democratic platform and, you know, that, then we'll have, a, uh, then we'll have a, a hearing with people and we'll sanctify it with some Bible verses and all of that, okay? It's not about that, okay? We see that a lot today. Or, you know, within the last 50 years, we saw evangelicals do that with the Republican Party too. So it happens both ways. And, and we can't do that because when we do that, we lose our prophetic voice in society. I was uh, reminded recently of a book that I read a few years ago is by a historian named Larry Hurtado. It's called Destroyer of the Gods. Great name for a book, by the way. But what he does is he studies how the early church went from a persecuted minority to being the dominant force in the Roman Empire over the course of just a few hundred years. And what he found was that the church adopted a particular social posture that centered on five things some of which were offensive to the culture, some of which went right along with it, okay? But they were authentically biblical, okay? And here are the five things that he, that he lists. He says, first of all, they were more multi-ethnic or multi-racial than the society around them. In other words, they, there wasn't prejudice. 
Okay? They just they believed that God was the God of all people, and so they accepted people from all races. They were more generous to the poor than the society around them. And he points out that the Emperor Julian, who uh, was, was wanting to, you know, he started to see what was happening in the Roman Empire and how Christianity was taking over, and, and Julian wanted to revive the glory of the pagan Roman days, right? And, uh, and so he was writing to some of his priests, and he was saying, here's the problem, is these Christians do a better job of taking care of our poor than we do. Not only do they take care of their poor, but they take care of ours as well, and so Christianity is winning, and he's lamenting this fact, right? Number three, Non-retaliation and forgiveness, okay? They were people who were committed to non-retaliation, non-violence. They forgave their enemies. Number four, they were positively against abortion and infant exposure, okay? Because of our belief that all life is sacred, the church has always been pro-life. Anti-abortion, yes, but even broader than that. When he talks about positively pro-life, what he means is, is there was, a, there was a practice in the Roman Empire of, you know, abortion was really difficult and it was very dangerous, and so a lot of women didn't have them even if they wanted to. And so basically they would have the baby and then they would just leave them out to die. Um, or oftentimes people would come by and pick them up and take them as slaves. But the Christians were not just against it in law or in principle, but they would actually go out and they would look for these babies who were left out for dead and they would take them in as their own. Okay, so they were against it, but they, were also, they also did something about it. So they were positively uh, pro-life. And then number five, they were a sexual counterculture. In other words, they were far stricter in their sexual ethics than the prevailing uh, culture around them. In fact, if you know anything about the Roman Empire, that's not really very hard to do. Um, you know, what's interesting is in the last year or two, might, might be two years, I've actually, I've read one and I've heard of another book by, by secular authors who have interviewed hundreds of young women who have said, you know, the, the, sexual, eth- the, uh, the, the sexual revolution that was supposed to free women uh, is actually not really doing that. And they're finding that all of these young women are very disillusioned with what's going on and are about ready to give up on dating and all of that because it's just not working for them, Okay. And this was the case for the church in the, early, uh, in the early days. They were sexual counterculture. Okay? Tim Keller talked about this book a few years ago, and, uh, and he pointed out these five things, and, and he said uh, there's something interesting about them, that, that there's two of them that we can point to and say these are values of progressives or, or Democrats, right? Multi-ethnic, generosity to the poor, There are two of them that are more conservative or Republican, opposing abortion and stricter sexual ethics, and one of them, non-retaliation and forgiveness that doesn't seem to be practiced by anyone. (laughs) And and this is what he says. This is the point. He says, one of the greatest ways to explain that the gospel is not the product of the particular culture, but actually comes from God, is that the community it creates would actually break through the categories authentically Christian living. And so as a church, we want to let our light shine in an authentically Christian way so that people may see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. To give us a hearing for the gospel. Okay, so that's what we do at, uh, at, at a corporate level, okay? But let's move on to how do we build trust as individuals? How do we build trust on a personal level? Now, while I understand why we might get defensive if people are mistrustful of Christians, if there's one principle, a general principle, it's that we need to resist the urge to have knee-jerk reactions that we talked about, okay? We know we're trustworthy, okay? But we have to be patient uh, because we don't know the experiences that people have had that have made them feel the way they do. For many people, there are some very legitimate reasons why they're mistrustful of Christians, and we have to be willing to, rather than react the way we oftentimes do and and get bitter about it, we need to be ready to to listen and to hear what they're they're saying. Okay, so how do we avoid knee-jerk reactions? Well, I think we can get a little bit from the passage that we read earlier in John chapter 4 with Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan 
woman. Because you see, Jesus walked into a situation with the Samaritan woman where mistrust had been building, not just for this woman's lifetime, but it had been building for centuries. I mean, there was an incredible amount of mistrust between Samaritans and Jews, and and you can see that in the response that she has to Jesus when he comes up and just asks her a simple question. Will you give me a drink of water? And what does she say? She points out the elephant in the room. She says, listen, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but you're a Jew. I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? See, what she's thinking here is, is now, wait a minute. Who is this guy? What are, what are you doing here? Why are you talking to me? What are your ulterior motives? How is this going to end up hurting me in the end? See, centuries of mistrust had threatened to derail the conversation. But one of the things that you'll notice, like always, Jesus wasn't caught by surprise. I don't think there was anything that really surprised Jesus. Except for, what was it, Nathaniel? I've never seen such great faith. He was surprised by that. But I don't see him being surprised by a whole lot else. He's not offended. But instead what he does, he stays with her and he draws her into a deeper conversation. Okay? Now, it seems like this comes pretty naturally for Jesus, right? But I don't think this is something that's natural for most of us. I think most of us probably want to react in one way or another. And so the question is, is how can we find the resources to be able to avoid these knee-jerk reactions? And again, if we go back to the book, they list five things that I think you know, we can also see in Jesus' response to the Samaritan woman. So what are the things? What are the, what are the resources that we have to not respond? Well, first, we have prayer, okay? We can pray. Now, to be fair, in that moment, I don't think we see in Jesus' encounter with a woman that he prayed right then and there, right? Maybe he did. I think he was in this constant conversation with with God, but, but he made it a habit in his life to continually go back to prayer, and to, be, and to be energized for that. And so I think that's why it came naturally for Jesus, because he was always connected to his Father. And so, you know, if this comes naturally for you to not react and just to be inquisitive and, and all of that, then great. But if you start to feel yourself being defensive or something like that, I think that probably the first thing to do is just to start to pray. Okay, first of all, pray, pray for yourself. Pray that God would just calm your heart. But I think also, pray for them, right? And, and, and the reason that I say that is, and I think you should do this not just when you're having conversations with people, but you should, have, you should be praying for non-Christians. In fact, pray for, Jesus says, uh, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, okay? Why did he say that? Well, it's because it's really hard to hate someone when you're praying for their good. Because, you know, in this process, it's not only, not only do other people need to change, but I think oftentimes we need to change. There's a lot that needs to happen in our heart through this process as well. And I think prayer is a big part of that. And so whether it's ongoing prayer or prayer in the moment, that's the number one resource that we have to avoid these knee-jerk reactions. It's always a good starting point. Second, Take the posture of learning. Okay, try to understand things from the other person's, person's perspective. Now, this actually requires a great deal of humility. When we read the story of the good Samaritan, or of the, the Samaritan woman, we oftentimes portray this woman as a hopeless sinner, a terrible sinner. Okay, after all, she'd been married five times and now she's living with a man. and So she must have been a pretty terrible person. But actually, if you understand the society at that time, that's probably not what was going on. You see, the problem is, is that women weren't allowed to initiate divorces to begin with. Um, and so, you know, why did she have five husbands? Well, they could have all died or they would have divorced her. Okay, they would have taken the initiative for that. And now she was living with a man. Well, okay, that's not ideal. But you know what? If you had been married five times and something had happened, you'd probably be a little gun shy about it too, right? And so Jesus, it doesn't say that he started asking her those questions, but he knew. He knew what was going on in her life. 
And I think it was because she, he was able to understand her situation, he, because he was able to, to empathize with her, that he understood and he didn't condemn her. He was able to empathize and he even accepted her even when we know that he believed she had some wrong beliefs because they get to that a little further in the conversation. Okay? He believed that she was wrong about God and faith and all of that. Okay? And yet he didn't condemn her. He accepted her. Now it models incredible humility when, when someone is negative toward you and you lean in and you ask their story. Well, sounds like you've had some really bad experiences in the church. I'm really sorry to hear about that. You want to tell me more about it? See, to be interested in someone else's story and to ask about it actually shows that you care. And I hope that you do, okay? And it shows that you're safe, that you can be trusted with their story. And then when they tell it, don't listen just to try to rebut what they're saying or try to counter what they're saying, okay? Listen to try to understand where they're coming from. And then respond with kindness. Guard their confidence. Accept their gift as a story and don't blab it to everyone else. Be open to learn uh, because that's important in all relationships, but especially in relationships where people are hesitant to trust you. Okay? They might have a good reason for that distrust. And so find out what it is. Third, in the book they say that we should bond. All right, now this is not something that you can always accomplish in one conversation. So I'm talking about developing relationships with non-believers. Studies show that on average, the longer a, a Christian, longer someone is a Christian, the fewer non-Christians they know. Okay, and that's understandable, right? We get involved in the church. We love to be around people who are like us. You know, we do enjoyable things with each other. And then pretty soon, you know, we're spending all of our time at Christian activities and, and you know, we don't have so many uh, non-Christian friends, okay? So, spend time cultivating relationships with non-Christians. It's good for you and hopefully it's good for them as well. Find common interests, okay? If you like sports, then get involved in sports with people, okay? Not just church leagues, but get involved in any kind of, you know, city league. Okay, if you're a parent, there will be many opportunities for you to connect with other parents. If you have a wood fire pizza oven, don't just invite people from the church, okay? Invite people from the neighborhood as well. Okay? This is what we call being incarnational, okay? Uh, we, we talk about uh, Christmas as the, the incarnation of Christ. It means Jesus coming in the flesh, coming to be with us. And so we're being, this, this model happens with Jesus that he came to be with us. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Right? And that's the model for our evangelism as well, that we are to be incarnational, to be in the flesh with other people as well. And so create bonds and nurture the relationship, okay? Not as a project. In fact, I did a, I did a video that, should, that you should have seen in your weekly last week. Hopefully, if you haven't looked at it, please do, uh, because it talks about how we can avoid making people projects. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's a real danger when it comes to evangelism, okay? But, but bond with them. Create relationships with non-believers. Fourth, find ways to affirm them, Okay? And I'm not talking about insincere flattery here, okay? I'm talking about recognizing that God has given all of us grace, okay? And those graces are present in them. And oftentimes, even in their criticism of Christianity, you can find something to affirm, right? Oh, yeah, you're right about the church, the, the sexual scandals in the church. Those are terrible. I can see that you're really concerned about justice. And so am I. So how do, what do we do about it, Right? We can affirm anytime someone has a spiritual impulse, okay? Even if we believe that where it leads them is not to the right place, if they have that spiritual sensitivity, we can affirm that in people for sure. Now, Jesus does this with the Samaritan woman in a very subtle way. You know what's subtle? He talks to her, <laughs> okay? Just the simple fact that he talks to the woman is affirmation, right? Jews didn't think that Samaritans were worthy of their time, and Jewish men only saw women as sexual temptation. And so Jesus breaks through both of those barriers and strikes up a conversation with her by asking her to use her resources to help him out. Okay? Now, when we make it our practice to affirm people, it's not just to butter them up. Right? 
Like I said, it's not just insincere flattery. But what happens is, is it changes them and it changes us because then we start to recognize the image of God in them. And it changes how we think about them and it changes how we treat them. And it also might change their attitude toward us as well if we can affirm something in them. Finally, welcome them. Okay, this means invite them into community. You know, humans are by nature tribal creatures. I don't know if you real. we don't really have tribes in America, but we're tribal, aren't we? We like to be with people who are like us, who think like us, who act like us. And the natural temptation for us is, especially when someone criticizes us or argues with us, is to separate ourselves from them and to go back to our people. And so it's important for us, of course, to be engaged in our church community. Okay, this is where we draw strength. It's where we draw inspiration. But we don't want to be closed off. Okay, we want to be continually inviting people in and be okay with people becoming a part of our community who don't necessarily buy into the whole program, who don't necessarily believe what we believe. Okay, that doesn't mean that we're compromising our beliefs, but we invite others in and let them see and experience what it is like to be us. You know, there are many ways that people come to faith. But I think one of the most common is they experience the genuine love and community of a group of Christians. And it makes them say something like, you know, they really are a bunch of weirdos. But there's something about them that I really like. Moving people from distrust to trust isn't a matter of executing a strategy. All right? it's, it's about being trustworthy. It's about genuinely loving people and having their best interest in mind. It's about realizing that life with Jesus really is better and caring that they have the best life that they possibly can have and the hope of eternal life later. That's what it's about. So I hope that you'll take these things to heart. One of the things that we're doing um, over the course of this um, or over the course of this uh, focus season, is we are going to ask that you guys just start to pray about maybe three people in your life. Maybe it's just one, okay? But start to pray about three people and just say, is there someone that maybe God has been nudging me to share with? Is there someone that I can see that God is already working in their lives and he's asking me to go and to, to be a part of their life and to share the gospel with them? Okay, and what we want you to do is, and we'll, you know, talk a little bit more about it, don't make them projects, okay? One of the things about projects is, is that you, you go, well, I'm going to be their friend in order to share Jesus with them, but if it doesn't seem like it's working, then I'm just going to move on, okay? That's a, that's a project, right? Okay, but strike up friendship for friendship's sake, and then maybe you'll have the opportunity to do it. In fact, take the opportunity to share Jesus. We've got a prayer wall at the back of the sanctuary there, and, and we would love it if, you know, when you decide who is it that I'm going to be praying for over the course of these next few weeks and beyond, just write their first name on a piece of paper that, that's right on the table below and just pin it up to the prayer wall, okay? And you make sure that you commit to praying for them, and we'll commit to praying for them as a church as well, and let's just see what God does. Let's see if the Holy Spirit works and gives us opportunities to be able to share and hopefully to draw people to him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word, and uh, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together as believers, to worship and to fellowship, and to learn more about you, to, to grow um, as your witnesses. And, and my, I think my greatest prayer, God, during these next few weeks is that you would be working on our hearts. God, that we would develop a, a passion for, for people who don't know you. That we would be so uh, consumed with your love for us that, that we know exactly what you did in our lives. We know that life with you is better and we want that life for the people around us. And so God, give us compassion. Give us boldness. Give us kindness. Give us the words, the wisdom to... Uh, to to know what to say and, and where to, to lead people as we speak to them about you. I pray that you would be making us effective witnesses for you throughout this. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.